So welcome everybody uh, to the Trauma-Informed Teaching and Pedagogical Practices webinar series as part of the European Toolkit uh, for the Schools uh, webinar series. Um, this webinar will be about the foundations of the trauma-informed approaches and the impact on a student's well-being, engagement, and academic achievement. But it will also provide some explorations about practical applications uh, of how teachers can be, and educators, and community members in general can be better prepared uh, to better face uh, these uh, real case uh, situations. I'm going to move to share my screen. So I will present some. <laughs> Sorry. Can you see it? Yes? OK. So welcome to this uh, webinar. As uh, already uh, mentioned, this is part of, of the European Toolkit uh, for the Schools. You might be familiar with this resource uh, that it used to be in the school education uh, gateway, but uh, more recently, this uh, it has been moved to the European School Education Platform, uh, which is a newly platform. So please look at it and look for the toolkit. Uh, the resources uh, are uh, very well selected uh, for uh, white audience. And uh, the toolkit uh, is uh, renamed for inclusion and well-being at the school uh, in order to promote inclusive education, but also the initial component and a component that is still very uh, vivid in the toolkit is the prevention of the school uh, early school leaving. Uh, this shift is aligned uh, with the recent developments and the communication of the European uh, Commission and the European Union on Pathways to School Success. So the emphasis is not only to prevent uh, a school dropout, but also to promote a school success. So here in the toolkit, uh, you will find uh, many uh, webinars like this one, because this is being recorded uh, for being this further disseminated and for further consultation on the on the education platform uh, website, but you will also find interesting articles, videos of particular schools all around Europe uh, focusing on particular issues, but also a lot of resources. These resources can be reports, uh, um, evaluation toolkits, uh, interesting practices, exercise, uh, and they are organized in these six sub areas. Uh, as you can see, one of the uh, areas uh, in which the toolkit focuses is well-being and mental health in school. This, this has been uh, a an, uh, new area that we have added to the existing ones. So, and this webinar will be part of this emphasis on this area that has been highlighted as one of the priority areas for the European Union. Part of the of the resources that we uh, that you will find in the toolkit are uh, derived from different projects, different European projects. A lot of uh, are uh, funded by uh, the Erasmus Plus, for instance, uh, model, but also from research, the Horizon Europe, or Horizon 2020, and this will be the case of the project that uh, is informing the webinar today. Uh, we will have two speakers that I will introduce uh, later on, Sarah Kate Vanderbilt and Nick Ockenden. Uh, they are both uh, members of the Refugee uh, Project Consortium, which is funded under Horizon 2020. And as you can see here in the identity of, of the project, uh, it, it's, it's about to finish. Uh, we are finishing this December. And uh, basically, the main objective is to promote what we call the dynamic integration of, uh, of minors, of migrants, uh, of, of minors of migrant descent, including refugee, asylum seekers, but also unaccompanied minors. Uh, we promote this dynamic integration uh, in, in three different settings, informal, non-formal, and informal education. And this is important because all the resources and all the proposals that, uh, that today will be presented to you will be used in different settings, not only in the school setting, but also in non-formal and informal education. The way that we promote this dynamic integration is through education, but with a strong component of what has been called MHPSS, that stands for Mental Health and Psychosocial Support. 
Uh, in promoting this dynamic integration, what we are aiming to improve in this in the refugee project is educational success, well-being, and sense of belonging. Uh, and we will see uh, for the presentation of the webinar today that they are all very interlinked and they are very uh, connected and that we don't need to choose if to focus on education or to focus on MHPSS, that we, we not only is it possible to tackle both at the same time, but it's really a real need for, for all the children around Europe. The way that uh, this project has been uh, developed and it's it's a requirement for all Horizon 2020 project is following a co-creation uh, approach. So that means that uh, all the results and all the resources are oriented and have been uh, co-created and are uh, oriented to be used by anyone in the community, not only professionals, but also children's families, uh, communities, NGOs, different professionals working in, in the communities, also policymakers who might be listening to us can take on uh, these resources and these strategies and uh, transfer to their, to their uh, communities. Um, and uh, this is the consortium. And an example of, of how we have promoted this dynamic integration is with these practices, both in the field of education, but also in the field of MHPSS, who have showed already to, to work, to be efficient, that we have evidence of social impact. Uh, that means that all the resources and all the strategies that, that uh, will be presented today uh, to you uh, have already been showed that they work and there are many, many different materials for you ready to be used and you don't need to have a degree, uh, you don't need to have a spe specialization in mental health to use them. So anyone uh, can uh, use and can draw from all these resources, both in the field of MHPSS that will be our focus uh, today, but also in the field of education that, that you can also consult the successful educational actions in the educational toolkit. So. Absolutely. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this um, today. Um, and as Sarah Kate said, fantastic. There's so many of you um, here. We're delighted to be able to share a little bit about um, one of the major outputs of the Refuge Ed project, the Brokering Knowledge Platform. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. I've just got a couple of opening slides um, just to introduce it. Um, so I hope, can people see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. Yes. So um, really, I just want to sort of introduce this and sort of say, what is the Brokering Knowledge Platform? So I'm sure you sort of are, are wondering what this is. But as um, Teresa introduced, the sort of major output of this project as a whole was really producing an online um, a website where people could come together and identify Maybe fine you can, you can include it as a as a presentation mode right sorry <laughs> thank you sorry yeah there we go yeah um yeah so essentially this is designed to be a central repository of resources for anyone who is working with and supporting children from a refugee and migrant background and people who want resources um, and additional things that can help them in their work. Um, and they can essentially come to this um, site, the Broken Knowledge Platform, and find out about those resources, download them, and so on. And as um, Theresa mentioned, um, we focus these very much in three areas. And these are resources that will hopefully support you in your work um, with this group of children, in work that supports their educational success, their well-being, and their sense of belonging. So those three sort of areas, essentially. Um, all of the resources on here are free to access. We wanted to keep this as open and as accessible as possible through all stages. Um, and essentially, it's really quite open to quite a wide um, audience, essentially, for um, very much for the group here today in this um, webinar, teachers, but also social and support workers, MHPSS professionals. Um, and also critically, we have been involving right from the start of this project, um, the families of these children themselves and the children and the communities they are drawn from, both in terms of testing some of the resources in the platform, but also sort of actually sort of um, understanding and how the platform works, getting their feedback in what Theresa mentioned was a very co-created process. I'm going to dive into the platform 
in a moment, give you a bit of a tour of it and a sense of what's in there. But this is the um, QR code, which will take you straight through to the platform. And below that is the um, the actual web address itself. Um, so please do have a look um, either now or um, afterwards when you have a, have a moment, we would love to um, get your thoughts on the platform and, and very much hope that this is um, a useful product for you. So I am just going to stop sharing there and then reshare so I can give you a, um, a sort of quick introductory tour of the platform itself. So I'm just going to open up the website. So hopefully you can see the, um, the platform itself now on the screen yes 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 Perfect. thank you great brilliant so when you click the qr code this is what you'll come through to um and this is your sort of landing page on the platform um and as you see really this is just very sort of introductory it will give you a sort of a brief um explanation of the kind of things you can be finding within the platform itself and and the main sort of content um Within this, there's there's just the top areas here on the navigation that I want to just talk through briefly. Four main areas um, to this platform, one being education and mental health. And this has been absolutely critical to the project and the platform, as Teresa mentioned, that this is about bringing together these two disciplines that sometimes are not seen to be um, working together, but in, in fact are incredibly complementary. So the whole platform is built on this um, approach. Um, and it goes into some detail. Secondly, the resources. And this is, I think, in some ways, the beating heart of the platform itself um, and probably where most users will find themselves, where you can actually download these tools, download these um, toolkits and so on. Thirdly, um, inspiring stories. Um, also core to the Refuge Ed project was the fact that we worked with 46 pilot sites um, across Europe in six countries. And um, those, what was um, tested within those pilot sites with communities, with children, with teachers, um, has gone on to directly inform the content of this platform. And that is very much about that co-created process. Um, but in this section, we'll also find case studies, which hopefully actually show sort of actually what this is what it's like on the ground. This is what it's like when you're implementing some of these practices um, and what works and what doesn't work. And then finally, the community section. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this in a moment, but this is our online space um, where we're sort of opening up and um, inviting people to join um, and to share their experiences um, online. So before I get into those, I just very, very quickly um, the about section. This will give you just a little bit more information about what the platform is attempting to do and what you can expect to find in here. So a sort of brief description of the platform itself um, and the content um, and crucially the a link back to the Refuge Ed project and the methodology that we employed in order to develop this platform in the first place. So I'm going to go into the first of these four sections now, um, the education and mental health um, part and as you've heard i think it's it is a really really important point that these um are very very complementary disciplines and actually it is about sort of where they they have been delivered and work together we're seeing that the impact on um, children in the classroom in community settings have been even deeper but essentially we've um, talked about the connection here between these two disciplines how they complement one another but we've also given some information here um, which is designed very much for someone coming in at a sort of base level not really knowing that much but if you also if you do want more detailed information it's available here so first of all if we're in the education section um, and this is crucially about uh, successful education actions um, SEAS, um and this gives a little bit of information about what 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 are these um, as an approach um, that can be used in the classroom some of the principles that are engaged um, and goes into a little bit of detail here about the different categories. So there's six main categories of uh, SEERS. And you'll see here, um, we've tried to use reflective of this um, platform generally, try to have something that is very sort of um, easy to use, very visual in a lot of cases. So where you see here, interactive groups as one approach and down this side um, gives a bit more information and you can go into more detail and find um, a lot more out about this particular approach and, and what it is, what it what is um, constituted of and um, further information, further reading. So then if we um, go back up to the um, top, 
Um, you can do the same for the MHPSS um, side of things. And that, again, gives a bit more information about what is um, a mental health and psych psychosocial support approach. Um, what does that look like with um, children? Um, we like a lot of places on this platform. We have some videos. Um, and equally, we have four categories of um, uh, uh, MHPSS um, support here. Um, very much in the same format that you've just seen. Again, sort of creating a safe space, for example, there's more information on this side, the detailed side, to give a, an explanation about what that actually is and means. Moving on, um, I want to talk a little bit about the resources section. As I say, this is sort of the core of the platform um, for many users. We've um, accumulated uh, nearly 600 different resources on this platform, and they are very varied from sort of um, online courses to toolkits to academic articles and um, anything that we felt and the users and the communities we've been working with have felt that would be useful in terms of helping and aid this dynamic integration of um, children from migrant background. Um, obviously, nearly 600 resources is a lot and that can be quite overwhelming. So we've spent quite a lot of time in this trying to sort of help people navigate their way through. And actually, if you're entering the site that you can hopefully quite quickly and easily find what you're looking for. And there's three main ways that we would um, recommend doing this. First of all, we've um, tried to sort of guide people through on somewhat of a, a user journey in some senses. And there's a number of different options here um, that we say, and for example, you might be interested in coming in and understanding about resources that are about preparing for an SEA or MHPS, uh, MHPSS activity before you implement it. And if you click on this, it will then highlight all of the different activities that are about preparation at some level. A second way um, to do this, I'll just clear that there. A second way to do this would be a, a more detailed search. So every single one of the resources on the platform has been tagged in a number of different ways. Um, and I'll just take you through an example of what this might look like. So for example, if we selected MHPSS resources as our particular interest in this case, um, and then we go down, we might want to then pick um, the type of audience um, who that who that is actually aimed at. Um, and given who we have here today, let's um, select teachers um within this and you see this is narrowing down from the 600 resources originally um and then going down further if we want um for example for the sake of this offline courses things that you can actually download and deliver um independently of um a computer or internet access um and then uh we wanted to select language. And this has been a big focus for us as well. We very much wanted to ensure that, that sort of a wide variety of languages are represented as both in terms of European languages, but also the language of the country of origin. Um, and we have um, certain languages, we've got more than 70 resources in Arabic on here, for example. So we've tried to sort of represent that in there. But for the purposes of this, our webinar today is in English. So let's collect um, English. And then you can see a number of different resources, six um, coming out here. Um, and um, then if you click on a particular resource, um, what you would then see um, is a bit of description about those and those resources, um, the language, the data publishing, who published it and so on. Um, I'm just going to talk about the third way that we want um, we would have designed this for people to search. And this is much more of a um, traditional search function, just a search box. Um, and um, Sarah Kate will be talking about one particular type of resource, um, psychological first aid um, for children, um, PFA. So if we just type PFA into the resource um, category here, um, and then we would come up with um, a number of different um, options here. And again, if we click in and view that, and crucially, again, it gives a similar sort of thing here. You can see how it's been tagged in here. And it's the web link that is probably the most useful here. And this will take you straight through to the particular resource where you can download it and access it. And as I said, everything in there is completely free to access. Nothing's behind a paywall. Um, and we've really tried to sort of keep that open as possible. Thirdly, um, the inspiring stories section um, I, meant, I mentioned. Um, and this is very much about the... the um, case studies, really, what happened on the ground with communities um, throughout the projects and the Refugee Aid Project's life. Um, and some fantastic activity working with schools, working with reception centres, where a lot of these resources were trialled and tested and, and refined, um, and communities involved um, um, 
families, children, um, a whole variety of different stakeholders. And what we've done is try to sort of create summaries of these, both again, you can search by different sort of settings, but for example, if we went into um, this one um, partner pilot site, a school in Bulgaria, you'll see it sort of set out very practically descriptions of what they did, how they implemented some of these approaches and practices, how they implemented some of the tools that you'd have been able to search for in a resources section, um, what its impact was and, and what some of the learning and um, recommendations. And down this side, on the right hand side, you'll see some of the categorization and crucially sort of where you can follow up for further information if you want to find that. But this section very much is designed to sort of bring it to life a little bit more, show that, OK, we have all these tools. This is how they can be used. This is how they can actually be implemented. And the final section I just want to talk briefly about is the community section. And this has been very much designed as an online discussion um, forum where um, people can come together, anyone who's working in this field, whether as a teacher, whether as a, um, a volunteer, um, some a support worker, or as a family member who is um, supporting the process as well. Um, a very simple registration process um, up at the top right. Um, we want to keep this as a closed community. We very much focus on it being a safe space. Um, so there's a sort of, we ask people to sign up to a number of um, uh, terms and conditions and rules of um, um, operation, um, but it's a simple free process um, to get involved. Um, and then you can post comments. And we've really sort of structured this around four key uh, forums, um, a general one. So if you've just got a sort of general discussion point about um, implementing CS and MHPSS with this group of people, one about preparing activities, one about implementing, and one about evaluating. Um, and if you go into these, you will see um, questions posed already, or you can sort of start a topic on the right and pose your own question and discussion or share good practice, whatever it might be. Um, we want it to be as useful as possible to, to the community. Um, I think that's really where I want to leave it. Um, this is very much um, an evolving um, thing. We've been um, developing this over the past couple of years in the project, um, but now we would love as many people to use it as possible, but we want to hear from you as well. Um, we want it to be a living document. So we would love feedback, both positive and negative. If you see things in there that you think are fantastic, we'd love to hear, but equally, if you th see things that could be improved, please do get in touch. Um, we'd also absolutely love for you to join the community. It's open to all, so please do, if you feel this is relevant, please do become part of the community um, and start um, discussing the topic with us and peers. Um, and the final thing is that um, while we are really pleased that we've got a lot of resources on here. We know that's not exhaustive. We know that new resources are coming online all the time. And there is scope within the resources section to submit new resources. If you see something on there um, that you're aware of something that is not part of the platform, please do submit it. It will come through to us and we've got a review panel who would look at that. So have a look. Um, please do enjoy browsing. I really hope this is um, useful in your work and helps you sort of identify uh, tools and resources that you could be putting into practice in the classroom. Um, but we'd love you to have a good look around, um, become part of the community um, and get in touch if you've got any thoughts or comments. So thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. I'm going to shot, stop right there. Um, but um, yes, enjoy the platform. Thank you. So to start, um, just to follow on what Nicholas was saying, is that we had taken a lot of our learnings uh, from RefugeJet and had made this Berkeley Knowledge Platform. Um, but before we had initially wanted to introduce the trauma-informed approach uh, before talking about how to use the Berkeley Knowledge Platform. But um, yes, I guess sometimes it's good to start backwards. Um, so I wanted to start with this uh, quote. So this is taken from a poem by Barson Sher, who is a Somali British poem poet who uh, wrote about the experience of refugees and migrants. Um, and just to situate us within this topic, um, I wanted to remind us that refugees and migrants do not leave home unless home is the mouth of a shark. And so, we need to also be recognizing that children are leaving their place of belonging, their place of safety, their place of hope, warmth, and kindness. 
Um, and, and these are the attributes which children need to be active and healthy uh, citizens of their community. So next, please. Um, so when we talk about children with a migratory background, we also need to recognize this dynamic relationship between their past traumatic experiences and their present um, experiences. And how they're situating themselves in the present is also related to what their past experiences have been. Migratory um, families and communities and children also have uh, cumulative stress, which is uh, the experience of multiple stresses um, almost happening simultaneously. They also are um, working through belonging and their identity, not only from what they had previously in their countries of origin, but through the journey, but and then also in their current um, situation. And so we need to recognize that we have a responsibility when we're working with these children, that these children need to be integrated into their host communities, um, that the host communities also need to be active in the solutions. Um, we need to improve their access to basic needs and services, and that these children are also the future leaders and citizens of this world. But at the same time, we can't forget the host children and these host communities because they also have experienced stress. And so when we are working with migratory communities, we also need to be working at the same time with these host communities. Um, so with Refugiate, we worked across six different pilot countries um, and we had uh, 46 sites. Um, and like Teresa mentioned at the beginning of the webinar is that these were across three different uh, types of settings. These were schools, reception centers, and institutional care. And these six pilot countries were in Bulgaria, Ireland, Italy, Sweden, Greece, um, and were really highlighting the fact that there were different cultures, there were different ways of um, being in these countries. And so we really had to have something that was uniform across uh, these the, the different pilot sites, the different community groups. Thank you. And so we decided to bring in um, MHPSS and education. Education is core to communities. Um, it's also an amazing space where children can go back to being children, where they can learn, where they can explore, where they can fit back into um, routine and having a safe space. It's also a basic right. It's um, a sustainable space. Um, there's no need for specialized services. And there's already a, um, a community, a support system, a network that we can tap into. Uh, so we adopted our mental health uh, definition. So if we go to the next slide, um, where, which is the World Health Organization's definition, which shifts um, looking at mental health as not a disorder, not as negative, but really looking at it as an a state of well-being where people are able to realize their own abilities, cope with the normal stresses of life, um, but also contribute to their community. Um, it recognizes that we all have mental health and um, that mental health exists on a continuum. And so we did a needs assessment. Um, and what we found across all of our different pilot sites was that there was a need for psychoeducation on the impact of stress and trauma. Teachers and those working with children needed to know how to identify MHPSS needs. Um, that there was also specialized, um, there was limited access to specialized services, and that we also needed a culturally sensitive approach to addressing mental health and psychosocial needs. And most importantly, that there was a need for safe spaces for these children. Because um, we saw that there were signs and symptoms of trauma, depression, isolation, stress, as well as low self-esteem, hopelessness, and anger. And so I wanted to turn this question to you. This topic has obviously um, been an area of interest. We have 100 participants. And I wanted to ask you, how do you define trauma? So if we could take 
two minutes to write in the chat and then I'll just pull out a few definitions. Um, if you could say how you define trauma. So I'll just put it in the chat. I'll just take two minutes to see uh, what your thoughts of trauma are. There's also no pressure. Oh, thank you, Radhika. An irreversible break. Yes. And I guess that could mean like an irre irreversible break within oneself, from society, from one's functioning. Um, Andrea says, a shock disrupting normal life with lasting impact. Thank you. And I think that's a really important um, emphasis on the lasting impact. It's not just about the event. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but looking at what is the impact on people. So it's going really fast. Um, so Hara, I think you said that you were from Lebanon. Um, trauma is a psychological or emotional response to an event or series of events that is distressing or harmful. It can result in long lasting negative effects on a person's mental and emotional well-being. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, it's exactly that. So looking at what is the, the impact of trauma, so not just the event. Um, and then from Wilson, which is a shock, which goes back to um, the original word of trauma in the Greek, which is wound. Um, great, thank you, yes. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Let's go to back to the presentation. So when we're talking about trauma, it's exactly what you were mentioning in the chat. It's not just about the event. It really is about how are we impacted. And so there were kind of these three core um, concepts that kind that that were emphasized when when you look at the American Psychological Association dictionary is that it's about an experience which has exactly long lasting negative effect on a person's attitudes, behavior, and other aspects of functioning. So thinking back to the mental health definition about how a person functions in their society, and then trauma being an emotional response. So not just about the event, but the emotional response. And then looking at it from, as well as the the individual's view of the world as a just, safe, and predictable place. So not just about um, the internal world, but also how the external world is understood. So if we could go into the next slide, please. Great. So when we talk about trauma, there seems to be a lot of emphasis on um, the life-threatening experiences. We have two um, types of trauma we have the big T and we have the small T and so the big T talks about um, war earthquakes sexual abuse physical abuse witnessing of violence death or abuse um, and or the death of a loved one so really about like these life-threatening experiences where the person's um, ability and um, existence in the world has been challenged um, when we talk about a small t trauma, we're also looking at how the self and the worldview is being threatened. Um, how is that person relating to the world? How um, how they are able to access uh, their basic needs? And some of these examples can be poverty, divorce, a separation from a family or loved one, limited access to basic needs, um, bullying and harassment. So Peter Levine, an amazing child um, psychologist, really points to an overlapping uh, factor of the big T and the little t trauma, which is about the loss of connection and really um, uh, positioning this loss of connection, not only internal, but also external. So how people are positioned in the world, maybe their loss of connection to their families, to the world around them. And sometimes this loss is not immediate so it can be over time where there's these subtle changes within oneself and within one's positioning of in in the world thank you and so when we talk about trauma and we talk about uh, high levels of stress we also need to be 
um, talking about the internal world. And this relates to what we refer to as the survival brain. Um, the brain is made up out of multiple systems and um, uh, types of um, gray matter and um, functions. But when, when we shift and we've been exposed to high levels of trauma over an extended period of time, our type of brain development changes and our stress hormones are released and because of that, there's changes in how we relate to the world and our body changes in how the stress hormones have activated in, in our responses. And so here we talk about the reptilian brain, which is about this survival. Um, and it's really concerned about our freeze, flight and fright. We then have the neocortex, which is the, the gray matter. Um, so when we see these pictures, it's the, it's the surrounding gray matter over the, the inner um, structures of the brain. Um, and this is really relating to like problem solving, decision making, reflection, concentration, and um, behavior regulation. And then we also have the limbic system, which is the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, and the amygdala which is relating to how, our, how we regulate our behavior, our emotions, our memory. And all of these are impacted by trauma. Um, when we have high levels of stress uh, hormones in our body and where we where our cognition, as you can see in the, these two triangles, where the cognition part of our brain is diminished. And so what is more highlighted is our survival response. So rather than being able to make decisions through thinking, um, taking time to regulate our behavior, and um, thinking about the social emotional consequences, we first go into survival. So we don't think about the impact of our responses, but it's about um, we just need to survive this. This uh, stimulus could be seen as a threat. And so we either step into flight, fight, or fright, or the new one, the fawn um, response. So if we could go into the next. And I just wanted to speak about these symptoms of trauma, not to have us, sorry, I don't know what's happening. Um, not because of um, the, the um, we are not going to diagnose people with trauma. But we can recognize that trauma has impacts on people without diagnosing them. And the Diagnostic Statistical Manual number five recognizes that for PTSD, um, for people to be diagnosed with PTSD, there needs to be certain symptoms of trauma. Um, but I'm not really going to go into this. I just wanted to highlight that these symptoms are really about the arousal, the um, the fact that the trauma is still happening with um, how people see the world so that their brains have really shifted into not seeing the present, not seeing where they are, but where the past still continues to have a huge impact on how they interact with the world. If we can go into the next, please. Um, and so these migratory children have really gone into a survival mode. Um, they've had to cope. Their body contains the stress, but, and a lot of times we look at their signs and symptoms of distress and trauma with these fight, flight, and freeze modes as bad behavior or bad attitudes. Um, when rather we also need to take a step back and say, is where is this coming from? Is this something that's happening now that they're responding to, or is this potentially something that's happened in the past that they are um, re um, responding to. Um, and so our first step for recovery is safety. So if you go to the next slide, please. And this is about shifting the brain from this trauma, from the survival brain into a learning brain. And Dr. Bruce Perry, an amazing psychiatrist who has worked with um, children who have experienced a, a wide um, array of ex uh, childhood adverse experiences um, has come up with this 
approach of reactivating the learning brain. And the first step is um, to regulate, to then relate, and then to reason. And I really wanted to highlight this because we cannot be working with um, children who have experienced high levels of distress when we are looking at their, their, their brain. So when we're wanting to, them to be thinking, when we're talking to them, rather we need to take it a step back and help a child to regulate their, their survival mode. So stepping into their bodies again, helping them to feel safe in their environment and helping them to regulate and calm um, their nervous system. And then we can step into this um, re relating, this uh, connecting, and then being able to help a child learn, remember, articulate, um, and and process what they've experienced. Great. Next slide, please. And so we think about safety. Judith Herman, another amazing trauma psychologist, um, recognizes that the first step to recovery is safety. And when we talk about safety, we don't just talk about physical safety, but we talk about um, this internal safety, this um, environmental safety, but also this connection and attachment, which is so important for children. Um, children rely on others to be able to make sense of their world. They also need to feel a sense of control and power um, to be able to understand themselves and the world around them. Great, so next slide, please. And then we'll just quickly hop over to a video which um, uh, summarizes what I've uh, just been uh, explaining. And then we'll go into the psychological first aid, which is one the main approach that we took with this project. Thank you. Can we share the video? Thank you. Stress is a part of life, for children too. In day-to-day -day life with occasional instances of stress, a child's brain functions properly. They can think, practice self-control, are open to new experiences and relate to other people. Children can often cope with more serious instances of stress as long as they are supported by an adult they trust. At times of stress, the body releases stress hormones that trigger the fight, flight or freeze reaction. The brain adapts within a second, the thinking mind is temporarily halted and instinct takes over. Once the danger has passed or a child feels reassured, the stress system calms. Comforting a child effectively means you are trying to calm their stress system. The zone in which someone can cope with stress is called the window of tolerance in psychology. As long as the stress stays within this window, there is no issue and a person can function normally. However, if the stress levels become too high or last too long, the stress shoots outside the window. This happens to children more easily if there is no adult around to help calm them. An experience can be so dire that it provokes an overwhelming sense of anxiety, helplessness and fear, causing a child to become traumatised. This can be the result of a serious one-off incident or a continuous unsafe situation, such as neglect or abuse at the hands of a parent. Chronic or continuous stress can, particularly at a young age, deregulate the entire stress system. That's to say that the system doesn't switch off. A child is then in a continuous state of alertness, so ready to fight, flee or freeze. The stress system becomes so sensitive that it regularly reacts to situations that are not dangerous. In other words, a child is less able to cope with stress their window has shrunk considerably. The oversensitive stress system ensures that stress hormones are released at the smallest reminder of a trauma. This so-called trigger evokes a severe reaction. This reaction can go two ways. If a child experiences a so-called hyperarousal, 
Their pulse rises, their body trembles, they feel pain and are irritable and become nervous. The child is emotionally and physically overwhelmed and behaves aggressively or fearful. However, the pulse rate can slow too. The child retreats, closes themselves off, avoids situations and seems unreachable, emotionless or passive. This is called hypoarousal. Whichever of the two the brain chooses, the thinking part of the brain temporarily closes down. A child can no longer think properly, learn or manage their emotions. You can help a child growing up in stressful circumstances expand their window of tolerance again. You can do this by ensuring they know they are safe with you and by helping to calm them in order to lower their stress. You can also help a child learn to recognize their own emotions, express themselves effectively and calm themselves. This way a child learns emotions are normal. They don't always indicate there's a threat. And so slowly but surely, their window can expand. The thinking brain can then function better, enabling a child to learn again, form new relationships and develop properly. Great, so just to um, quickly wrap up, so if we could uh, go to the slide on PFA for children. Sorry, everybody, we've been a bit uh, tight with time today. Um, so uh, that's slide 24, Teresa, if you don't mind. Um, so PFA for children. Um, PFA is an approach that, or a set of, of tools rather, sorry, um, that was designed to develop um, people's ability to respond to those who have experienced highly distressful events. Um, and so there's three key components to it, which is look, listen, and link. Um, and these three components work together to create a safe space where children can feel connected to their caregiver, um, to the environment around them where they can feel safe, um, where their emotions, their attitudes, their behaviors can be understood, um, and that, that their um, needs can be linked to. And so one of the key things I want to highlight here is that when we're doing PFA for children, we are not taking the full responsibility for their needs, we're recognizing what we can do. And when there are signs and symptoms that are concerning, we can then refer. Um, and so this also helps you as a practitioner or as someone looking after children to not feel responsible for the child for responding to these highly um, concerning um, uh, signs and symptoms and to know that you can get support from other people when providing this. You're not meant to be um, providing this in-depth psychological support for children. Um, and these are the, the when to worry. Um, so if a child is uh, talking about harming, suicidal, when there's withdrawal, when there's high emotions, um, dissociation, hallucinations, or anx anxiety attacks. Um, and then I just want to end finally on the self-care. It's really important um, for you to be looking after yourself, uh, to be able to look after others. Um, here's some options for you to be able to do this, um, thinking about uh, all these different ways that you can look after yourself uh, to be able to provide support to others. So yes, sorry we had to rush through this, but as Nick um, presented the Burfree Knowledge Platform is that you can look at all of these different types of approaches and you can um, see how you can apply them to your, your own work. And of course, we are here to support you in that. So great, thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you, Saragate. Uh, thank you, Nick. So now we have a few minutes uh, to respond to some questions. Um, 
One question uh, that has been asked is, uh, thank you for very useful foundations on the concept of trauma and how it manifests in student experiences. Would it be possible to share a few techniques, approaches, how teachers can use this knowledge that children are experiencing trauma, but they still need to follow the learning process in the classroom? And how other children can be made aware and sensitive mm -hmm. to trauma of other uh, classmates? Yeah, thank you. Um, so what immediately comes to mind, and um, not to uh, promote too much this the project that we've done, but we have successful educational actions, um, which also uses storytelling. Um, and with children, they also need to be able to understand um, concepts, ideas, but storytelling is a huge way to be able to do this. Um, and su successful educational actions, um, one of the approaches and the stories that they used was actually the Odyssey by Homer, um, which speaks about the, the migratory refugee process and it puts into words and can start conversations around this. Um, and something that we didn't go into uh, in the presentation is also the age groups. Um, the when where a child is in terms of their development, in terms of what they need, um, will also impact how you would um, create a safe space, talk about um, trauma, talk about emotions, and provide support to to children. Um, uh, so that would also need to be taken into consideration. Um, but I would suggest. Uh, working with children, talking to children in the language that they understand, um, not focusing too much attention on the emotion or the behavior and labeling the behavior, but rather looking at um, how is the child feeling and talking to what is currently happening in the situation. Um, yes, just just briefly, but uh, there's a lot in there and you can actually find a lot um of activities and support within the Brophy Knowledge Platform. Um, so if you have identified that maybe there's um, conflict, um, this child is showing um, high levels of aggression, um, if you go into the Brophy Knowledge Platform, you'll be able to identify maybe conflict um, and then up will come up different activities and you can actually use that in, in your classroom or in your setting. Thank you. Thank you, Sara. Is there any other uh, question? Maybe I could ask you uh, a question because sometimes the, the, I mean, from the refugee project, we have experience that sometimes we face with teachers who can identify that there are uh, issues uh, and there are uh, uh, children with trauma or with other uh, needs, uh, MHPSS needs, and um, but they feel that they don't have the tools or that they have they cannot do anything. That they need a specialist in the in the school team. And of course, it's good if we have ex specialists in the in the schools and in the communities. But uh, uh, these approaches. Uh, so how do you uh, how do you work in the MHP? PSS approach in these situations in which there is not a specialist. What can we do uh, yeah. as a specialist? Thanks, Teresa. And yes, um, I think this is a really important con uh, question. Um, and going back to the definition of mental health, um, recognizing that we all have mental health um, and that we don't necessarily need specialized support to be building a healthy uh mental well-being um and uh one of the ways that we do this in mhpss is that we have a triangle approach and so uh, we have we recognize that most people actually just need to be empowered they need to feel like they've been treated with dignity and they need to be felt as if they have a sense of agency again um and part of that is creating the safe space and so 
what we did in the refugee project and just generally is that we we want to equip people who don't have a mental health background with the ability to support people and we do this by pro providing um, psychoeducation so people having a very basic understanding of what is mental health what is psychosocial well-being we then also include um, how do you talk about emotions how do you understand emotions and then also how do you listen to people how do you identify if someone is distressed how do you engage with that person? And then how do you give that person the skills and the ability to take ownership of their current situation? Um, but at the same time, knowing when to refer. So recognizing that you have a limitation um, and knowing when you need to refer out to, to others for the specialized support. Yes. Oh, and then, sorry, just... On that note, on the Brokering Knowledge platform, there is a video that you could watch, which actually um, was the video that we um, shared to our pilot sites on how to build their basic mental health and psychosocial um, knowledge to be able to provide the, the skills to build the agency, empower, and uh, create a safe space. Actually, this is the training, the video that we provide in, in the sites that we couldn't deliver the training in person, right, Sarah? Mm -hmm. Exactly. I don't know if there is any other uh, question. People are uh, congratulating uh, you and Nick. Uh, uh, the links that have been mentioned have reshared again. And people are asking for the presentations that will be made available. Um, okay, so I think that if there are no more questions, maybe we can leave it here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nick and, and Sarah Kate, for this uh, splendid and excellent uh, webinar. Uh, I'm sure that there, there will be, I mean, we have been like 100 people connected the whole hour from all over uh, the world, I could say. Uh, but I'm sure that this will be many, very useful for many teachers, educators, professionals, family members, community members that are struggling and that are facing, uh, are, are experiencing uh, to work with children with uh, traumatic experiences. And I'm sure that this will be very useful for them to rewatch and to review reveal this webinar thank you very much and uh, we invite you to visit all the websites the european toolkit website as well as the brokering knowledge platform uh, to look for more resources that i'm sure that will uh, inform your practice thank you very much